the old sanctuary. Amen. Shoulder to shoulder, standing room only. Powerful moves of God. Over the years, the location has changed. The crowd has gotten larger. Amen. But these men have stayed the same. The, the move of the Holy Ghost has stayed the same and even gotten stronger. We're thankful for that. I wonder if we could stand to our feet as this elder comes. Lift your hands. Can you worship God one more time as Elder Gary Howard from Tulsa? Jesus. Well, I don't want to spend a lot of time in preliminaries, but I do want to say thank you for your response to the word of the Lord last night. Uh, you're an easy group to preach to. The crowd can either shut a preacher down or pull the best out of him. And uh, I know how to preach when nobody's with me. I've preached at times when I was probably the only one there that believed what I was preaching, but I went ahead and preached it anyway. And uh, but I tell you what, when you really want to hear from God, it's such a it's such a wonderful thing to be able to preach to hungry people, hungry people. Just um, something I've enjoyed doing most of my life. Started when I was about ten years old. I like to cook, and uh, I like to cook for a group of people, and. Um, when I cook, I want them to enjoy what's been prepared. And if, if they just pick around on it, I feel like I have really failed. Amen. But I feel hunger in this place today. And I really thought that the service would go ahead and conclude where we were a little earlier. But uh, God knows what he wants. And... Uh, I also submit to the will of the brethren. If they feel like I need to go ahead and preach now, then I'll endeavor by the help of the Lord to bring something that I think is important, something that we need. And I'd like to read a couple of verses of scripture from the 27th chapter of Exodus, beginning in verse 20. Before I read it, I want to say again, thank you for the wonderful hospitality the wonderful, comfortable room that's been provided and all the other extras that uh, is kind of the signature touch of the Heritage uh, Pentecostal Church and uh, love and appreciate uh, this church very, very much. I've been a part of it for a number of years in as much as I've had the distinction of serving as an elder to first of all, Bishop Johnson and the church continued on under the leadership of Pastor Burgess. And uh, I, I just think it's a beautiful, wonderful thing the way that Pastor Burgess has stepped up and carried such a load and the church carrying such a load and yet allowing Bishop Johnson to provide the direction. And uh, we need his input. It's his burden, his vision. And uh, you just can't replace that. And so, uh, again, thank you for everything and to all of our friends. God bless you. Always good to be with you. Exodus 27, verse 20. Thou shalt command the children of Israel that they bring thee pure oil, olive, beaten for the light, to cause the lamp to burn always. In the tabernacle of the congregation without the veil, which is before the testimony, Aaron and his son shall order it from evening to morning before the Lord. It shall be a statute forever unto their generations on the behalf of the children of Israel. If I could direct your attention back to verse 20. The commandment is to cause the lamp 
to burn always. For the light, the fire, to never go out. But it required everyday maintenance in order for that to happen. Fresh olive oil had to be beaten every day. And somebody had to trim the wicks on the lamps. And somebody had the responsibility of seeing that the uh, lamp itself was filled with pure beaten olive oil. Amen. And so I want to talk to us for a little bit. I don't think I'll take a lot of time. I realize that you've been here for quite a while already. But I think it's important that we consider these things before we leave this conference. That when I leave and go back home, I've got a personal responsibility to keep the fire burning that's been ignited in my spirit while I've been here. It's my personal responsibility. Let's give thanks to the Lord for his word. Lord, we do praise you. We exalt you. We bless your holy name. God, we ask you to come and talk to us one more time. Give us direction, inspiration. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you. You can be seated. You know, the Bible uses very primal, very simple things. Uh, things concerning life to help us understand things of the spirit. And the Bible talks about things. We've been talking about water around here, water. And, uh, and that's a good subject, and I thank God for it. But uh, other analogies that's used through Scripture to typify uh, the, uh, the spirit of God is fire, fire. So uh, wells of living water springing up. Amen. From your innermost being, uh, that's talking about the Holy Ghost. But also when it talks about the fire of God, it's talking about the spirit of God that fills your heart and fills uh, your life. Amen. And sets your soul on fire. So we need both, don't we? Isn't it amazing how that we can be on fire and full of water at the same time? <laughs> but God knows how to make, don't try that at home, but God knows how to make it happen. Amen. But uh, uh, one of the things that uh, was necessary for the advancement of civilization was fire. One of the earliest tools that was used in ancient times uh, to improve the quality of life is fire. You can cook food with fire. There's a lot of things you can produce with fire. Uh, there is, uh, of course, stay warm uh, when it's cold. And just so many, many things about fire that's very, very important we use, when you think about it, in some form or another, it's a controlled type of fire, but we use it to cook our food, provide heat when we're cold, produce energy to drive our vehicles, machines, and power our iPhones. Does that electricity come from somewhere that charged up your battery? Amen. And so, in the modern times, we've got, uh, you know, we have, it's easy to have a fire. Everything is, you know, everything has, uh, technology has changed everything. Uh, we used to, you know, always, if we was going to cook outside, it was charcoal or wood. And you work and work and work and get it going and you tend to it and on and on. And then finally you get it where you want it. And it was quite a task to get all that done. And now they got a little propane bottle hooked up to it. And you got a little button. You just turn the knob on and push the button and boom, it lights. And that's really the way we'd like for it to be for Holy Ghost fire. And I know some people that's been trying that, but I'm a little concerned about the fire that they're igniting. So in bygone years, you had to build a fire from scratch without lighters, without fire accelerants, without any of the, uh, of the conveniences that we have nowadays when I was uh, about 12 years old. I joined our, our church, sponsored a, a Boy Scout troop, and I joined that scout troop. And uh, one of my favorite things about going out and camping out was building fires. Some of the guys never did get the knack, but I didn't mind building for them. I've always loved to build fires. I, I'm fascinated with fire. I've gotten in trouble over fire. I didn't intend to set the school grounds on fire. But when you play with matches, you never know what's going to happen. 
And, and so fire has always been a big deal. I have a fireplace in my house, and, uh, and it has a gas log. Can you believe that? When I love to cut wood, split wood, burn wood, but my wife has an allergy to smoke, and several of my grandkids do, and I can't even build a fire in my own fireplace. But we just fake it. <laughs> kind of like the modern-day Pentecostal movement. But we, to, to pass to a certain, uh, you know, uh, in scouting, there's different uh, levels that you achieve. And w- on one level, one of the things you had to do was be able to start a fire with one match. And, uh, and then there was a merit badge involved that you had to be able to start a fire with one match with uh, wet wood, the weather wet, everything was everything against you. And you had to use all the skills that they had taught you to get a fire going. And uh, one uh, story that I read when I was a kid that really, really fascinated me is written by this uh, uh, classical author by the name of Jack London. He published this in 1908, and the title of it was To Build a Fire. And uh, the setting of this story was way up north where it's really, really cold in the winter, like Alaska, Yukon, somewhere up in that very far north cold country. And a man set out on a trip, uh, uh, and uh, it was a time of year when things could change rapidly. He made some miscalculations, and he ended up having problems, and uh, hypothermia was setting in. He was trying to find a place where he could build a fire, and he struggled and struggled and, and almost too cold to be able. He's down to one match, and he's trying to light a fire. And finally, he was able to uh, uh, get that match lit and a fire started. And he was up under some uh, spruce trees and there was snow in the trees and, and uh, the fire flared up and, and, and began to uh, warm him up. And just as he was beginning to uh, enjoy the benefits of that fire, guess what happens? What does heat do? It rises. And the snow in the tree all of a sudden released and fell down and put out his fire. And that's the end of the story. You write the ending. They found him sometime later and pieced back together the tragic thing that had taken place. Some parts of the world today, there's very primitive people that live back in forest and wastelands and so forth, and they still live... Uh, very, very primitively. They must have fire. And they don't have matches. They don't have lighters. They don't have strikers. They don't have anything along that line. Starting a fire for them is very, very difficult. And so one of the most important jobs in the village or in the little tribe, the little area, is to keep the fire going. And uh, they don't take this lightly. In fact, if you're in charge of keeping the fire going and the fire goes out, everybody in the village is down on you. I doubt anybody will ever have any confidence in you again. And there are times when the fire goes out and they will dispatch some swift runners, some men that uh, can run a marathon, and they, they carry with them some kind of a little uh, uh, earthen vessel or something that they can get some coals from a fire from some other village at, off a long ways. And I've read stories about all the efforts that they went through and, and, uh, and how happy and excited the village was when somebody returned with some live coals and they were able to have a fire again. Amen. I believe there's people that have come to this conference really, really in need of, of a renewing of the Holy Ghost as uh, Elder Garrett just preached to us about. Didn't he do a fabulous job? Amen. I'll never forget that message. And this renewing of the Holy Ghost is a very uh, a very essential and necessary thing in our walk with God, our experience with God. And, uh, and it's important. It's important that the things that you received here at this convention that you take it home with you and then you own the responsibility of keeping that 
going forward. Keep the fire burning. Keep the stream flowing. Keep the joy of the Holy Ghost bubbling up within your soul. Amen. We like to put the responsibility off on someone else. We want somebody else to pray it down, shout it down. Amen. Then we are satisfied with the splash over blessing. You can't live in this day and hour and survive on splash over blessings. Amen. As I preached to you last night about the wells that Father Abraham dug, and then Isaac had to come along and dig his own wells. I didn't have time to finish that last night, but just one little thing here. After he redug all the wells that his father had dug, it's like he learned how to dig and locate those kinds of wells, and he went on and dug many other wells and left a heritage for his children. Amen. But he had to learn how to build upon what his father had built before he was able to move forward with his own program. Just a little interesting side note there. But uh, throughout uh, the word of God, God has revealed himself in fire. Many, many places, many special moments in the Bible are signified by God revealing his approval or his glory by fire. No doubt uh, that when God accepted Abel's sacrifice and rejected Cain, everyone knew that God had approved of Abel's sacrifice. He had offered to God something that was to be a burnt offering. And I am convinced, I do not have a question mark in my mind, that what happened was that fire fell from heaven and consumed Abel's sacrifice. Thus God signified, this is the type of sacrifice and offering that I will accept and only this. And we see that pattern again and again throughout scripture. God first appeared to Moses and called him to go back to Egypt and liberate his people from slavery. Amen. Appeared unto to him in a bush that was burning with fire but not being consumed. Now that ought to get your attention. We've all seen fire. We expect to fire to consume things. I have a place in the country, a lot of trees, a lot of brush. Every so often I do a little clearing and do a little cleaning up, trim some trees and brush and all that and get a tremendous amount of, uh, of limbs and, and leaves and on and on and on. And I call the fire department, let them know I'm going to be burning. I, ha- I can do that where I live, but they appreciate the heads up because some neighbor will always call them and say, there's a big fire breaking out over here. And they've made a couple of dry runs years ago when I first got there, so we talked about it. And uh, this is how we go about doing it. Amen. But when you, when you set fire to that brush and it catches on fire and it begins to cons- consume it, there's a big pile out from my house there. And it, it, it would cover probably uh, half of this platform and stacked up about 8 to 10 foot high. And when that fire finished burning, you could have put all the ashes in about two small wheelbarrow loads. It went from that to that. All the brush was consumed. So if I see a pile of brush on fire and it's not being consumed, it's going to catch my attention. There's something strange going on here. I'm going to check this out. That's why Moses turned aside. He'd seen brush being burnt many, many times, but this time there was something significant about it. I'm going to tell you what. I believe we have seen some supernatural fire burning here this week. Amen. How many of you felt, amen, the fire of God burning in your soul? Amen. Purifying, cleansing. Amen. And so uh, there's so many, many other places in Scripture where God appeared as fire. When, when Moses led the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage and when uh, they came to the Red Sea and Pharaoh changed his mind and sent his army after them, God put a 
pillar of fire, amen, between the Hebrews and between the Egyptians that they weren't able to get through, amen. And that pillar of fire was with them their entire 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, which signified that God is in their midst and he's leading them and guiding them to the place where he wants them to go. I want the Shekinah glory of God and the fire of God, amen, to be a perpetual part of the church that I pastor. Amen. I don't want the fire to go out. And so uh, then we come, uh, the Bible says, he took not away the pillar of the cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. Let me just hit a few things quickly here. Exodus thirteen twenty one states, the Lord our God is a consuming fire. In Deuteronomy 4 and 33, God spoke off Mount Sinai, a big fire on top of the mountain. And it says the Lord spoke to Israel out of the midst of the fire. At the dedication of the tabernacle, fire from the holy place came out. Amen. It consumed the sacrifice on the altar. Amen. Solomon, when he dedicated his temple many hundreds of years later, again, the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the sacrifices that had been offered up to honor and give praise and glory uh, to the Lord of hosts. Amen. And the Bible says the fire came down from heaven, consumed the sacrifices and offerings, and the glory of the Lord filled the house. Amen. Again, we all know about the challenge that Elijah made uh, to King Ahab and the false Baal worshipers when he invited them to a contest on Mount Carmel. Amen. And here's what Elijah said. Here's what we're going to do today. The God that answereth by fire, let him be God. And you know the fire fell. Praise God. Amen. Amen. And so kind of backtracking here a little bit, let me just point out a few more things about the fire. When, a, a, when God accepted Abel's offering, realize that Abel went to great effort to prepare an offering that would be, success, would be acceptable to the Lord. Amen. He, 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 took, a, he took a lamb from the flock, a perfect lamb without blemish. Amen. He prepared it. He got the wood together. He built an altar. He put everything in place. And when it was finished, he put it on there and he prayed and offered this to the Lord. And God accepted his sacrifice because it was done in an acceptable manner. Praise God. And of course, when Moses had fulfilled God's instruction and every detail of the tabernacle given to him by God was taken care of, all of its furnishings were in place, and then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the sacrifice. There are things we want God to do. Sometimes we want God to do for us what we're supposed to do for ourselves. God wants to reveal his glory God wants his fire to be manifested in every youth group that's represented here today, in every church that's represented here today. But there are things that are necessary for us to do to gain the approval of God and for the fire to fall and consume our offering that we offer unto the Lord. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. So uh, when Solomon made an end of building, the temple. And again, everything in place. Thousands of animals were offered as sacrifices. Blood flowed by like a river. Amen. But when everything was in place and everybody was in their proper place, Solomon prayed a sincere prayer and God answered that prayer and showed his acceptance by the fire that fell on the altar. On Mount Carmel, Elijah built again, what? The altar of the Lord that was broken down. It had been neglected for decades. Nobody had offered an offering to God on that altar that had been dedicated sometime in the past 
to the glory of God. But uh, Elijah said, if we want God to fall, we got to repair some things. I wish I had time to go into it, but there are things that we need to take care of in our lives. Amen. There's some things that need to be repaired. Maybe relationship with your pastor, relationship with your parents, relationship with other young people in your youth group. Amen. Things that need to be dug out of your life. Amen. Strife, confusion, competitiveness, jealousy, emulation, trying to outdo one another, putting others down to elevate yourself. These things must go if we want the fire of God to fall in our midst. There's got to be harmony, unity, and love and cooperation. You can't be a bitter person and enjoy God's blessings. Bitterness will cut you off from the blessings of God. You'll dry up spiritually, amen, and die if you allow a root of bitterness to spring up in your life. It's so important. I didn't even intend to say this, but I'm feeling something very strongly. There's some young people here today that needs to get over bitterness. Bitterness is cutting you off from God's blessings. Bitterness is destroying your life. You'll not be able to have a relationship. You'll not be able to have a family. You'll not be able to be successful in life because everything you build up, you will tear it back down again because your life is controlled by bitterness. It's time to get it out now and deal with it once and for all. And let's move on. Amen. You can be seated. I'm moving on. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues. You know how flames are the fingers coming off of it. Cloven tongues like as a fire and it's set upon each of them. I don't think you can get the Holy Ghost without there being some fire involved. We may not see it, but I'm telling you it's there. Amen. That fire's there to cleanse, to purify, to signify, amen, the blessings of God, the approval of God, his acceptance. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it set upon each of them. And it was then that they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Could I back up just a little bit? Before that fire fell, chapter one tells us of an interlude of time of several days between the ascension of Christ into heaven and when the fire fell on the day of Pentecost. They were together in prayer. They were together taking care of some things that need to be taken care of. They were getting things in order so that they might offer unto God a sacrifice that was acceptable unto him. He had promised them that they would be filled with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Amen. And so he also told them to go back to Jerusalem and to tarry there, to wait there until the endued with power from on high. You know our problem is we don't wait on God. We got so much zeal and and desire and excitement that sometimes we jump up and get ahead of God and run ahead of God. And then when we get there, what we thought would happen doesn't happen. Amen. You're not wasting time when you're waiting upon God, when you're seeking God, when you're drawing nigh unto God. It's when we draw nigh to him or when we approach him or when we pursue after him that he comes to us. Amen. When you draw nigh to God, he will draw nigh unto you. There is that time of waiting. We need to learn how to wait upon the Lord. Thank God for the dance, the shout, the hollering and all of that. But if that's all that your worship consists of and your relationship with God, it's very, very shallow. 
Amen. You're never going to grow in God and become what God wants you to be. There's got to be that time of seeking the face of God and preparing yourself as an acceptable sacrifice unto God. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and everybody shout acceptable. We're trying to please God. Not the pastor, not your parents, not one another. But if you please God, you'll please godly parents. You'll please your pastor. You'll please others. Amen. That love God. But our focus and attention is upon I want to offer something that God can accept. Please be seated. Can you imagine? Try if you would. How Cain felt. He worked hard to prepare his sacrifice too. He brought the produce of the ground. If y'all ever worked on a farm, if you ever helped gather vegetables and fruits and things of that nature, how many have ever done that? Have you ever been employed doing it? A few of you still have your hand up. Yeah. It's hard work. Have you ever had a garden? Oh, I love to see beautiful gardens, but I cringe because I know what it takes to have a beautiful garden. Amen. And uh, I used to always have a nice garden, but I got to traveling so much, I'd get all the work done and get it, and when it was ready to harvest, I wasn't even there to enjoy it. Somebody else got it or the wild animals got it. So I'm back to buying at the grocery store like you do. It's not nearly as good as what you can grow at home. But I'm going to tell you something. There was sweat. There was toil. There was labor. There was preparation. Picking out the choices, the best, the biggest, best, ripest tomatoes, amen, the cucumbers, the squash, the green beans, uh, and the list goes on and on and on. What do you like, okra? Amen. You like Anybody like fried okra? Anybody like fresh sweet corn? on the cob, amen, just being pulled fresh and shucked and, oh, Lord, help us. I better get off of this or everybody's going to sneak out and go get lunch. Amen. And and so Cain brought all of these things and and uh, the cantaloupes and, and, oh, my goodness. Do I dare say it? Do I dare say it? Does anybody besides me like watermelon? I'm telling you this year, I've had the best watermelons I've had in years. It's been incredible. I don't know if I'm lucky, but I've eaten watermelon in several different parts of the country and I've run the same thing. They're sweeter and juicier and... Amen. Somebody said, take me to the water. I said, take me to the watermelon patch. <laughs> Boy, somebody's about to get the whole ghost over here. I hadn't seen that much out of you this whole conference. <laughs> Think about this. When they left where Jesus ascended in, into heaven and they went back to Jerusalem to an upper room, it seems, makes sense to me probably where they had the last supper, but there's no proof that it was, but whatever. It was an upper room. And there they had to take care of some things. I don't know if you remember this or not, but the very, well, the, uh, uh, the night of, of the Passover, that last supper, the disciples were in a dispute over what? Who was going to be greatest in the kingdom of God? Disputing among themselves while Jesus is knowing that he's facing crucifixion and all the things connected with that. His disciples, one he had chosen, ones he had poured himself into, they're sitting here arguing among one another which one was going to get set on the right hand and which one on the left hand when he comes into his kingdom. 
You know, God can't bless that kind of a spirit. That sectarian spirit, that spirit, I want to be the big shot. I want to be the one in charge. I want to be the one in charge of the youth group. I want to tell the other kids what to do, and they need to listen to me because I know what I'm talking about. And I'm not talking about the leaders that have been given authority. I'm talking about some people that are always promoting themselves, always promoting themselves. Amen. So there's a lot of friction, a lot of turmoil, a lot of division. That was not a cohesive group. Each one of them was contending for their own individual interest. And before the Holy Ghost could fall, they had to do the same thing that every person has to do before the Holy Ghost will move into their heart and life. What is that? You got to repent. I'm just using my imagination, but I've got a good one. And I see them over there praying, getting down to business. Oh, we want that Holy Ghost that was promised. Why can't we get the Holy Ghost? I want it, I want it. And then happen to think about, this is Peter, he happens to think about what he said about John. And he kind of feels like, you know, that might have hurt John's feeling. Oh, well, he can get over it. Oh, I want the Holy Ghost. Tell you the big baby, he just needs to grow up. If I, if I, I'm a lot older than he is, and if I say that to him, he'll think he, he's going to lord it over me. Oh, God. He, he's supposed to preach a, a real important message here before long. He's not ready to preach that message yet. You understand? There's some things that need to be taken care of. And one of the things that God's been dealing with us in this youth conference is let's get things taken care of. Let's get things right. Let's get it in order. Amen. Let's get together. Let's be what God wants us to be. Let's have what God has promised us we can have. Praise God. That dig in the debris out of the wells is things that people purposefully put in there. You understand what I'm saying? And I think I think we could spiritualize that. Some of it could be, as I mentioned a little earlier, some of those rocks and sticks and trash could be envy, jealousy, strife. Are you listening to me? Amen. How are we going to have what God wants us to have? How are we going to have the water God wants us to have flowing until we get that stuff dig out, dug out? We're not dealing with natural rocks and debris. Amen. To get what we're after, we're dealing with spiritual things. We've got to pull down some high places. Amen. Some are too stuck up, too much pride in God. You need to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. He'll exalt you in due season. There's no place in God's kingdom to be used by God for those that are full of pride. Amen. You don't need to be proud as being full of yourself. You need to empty yourself of yourself so that you can be filled with him. Replace pride with humility and then you are a vessel that God can use for his glory. I've seen some young preachers just getting started and I cringed every time God used them because I knew I'm going to have to deal with pride here because they just couldn't handle being used of God without allowing it to puff them up. And God can only go so far with you when you allow pride to creep in and you take credit. You take credit for what only God should receive credit for. So they were disputing over who would be the greatest in the kingdom of Jesus. They had to prepare themselves for the promise of the Spirit. Amen. So as they offered themselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, when they got everything taken care of, they even took care of a little business, appointed somebody to take Judas's place. Everything is in place. 
had to be. People, do you understand where I'm coming from? These things had to be before the Lord could signify with that supernatural fire that falls from heaven. And then the Holy Ghost breaks out. They're drunk, but not as you think. Amen. They're drunk on Holy Ghost wine. This is that that was spoken by the prophet Joel saying in the last days it shall come to pass saith God I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh this is fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy this is fulfillment of what Jesus said when he prophesied you're going to receive the Holy Ghost not a few days hence when Jesus, when they were told and reminded by the angels to return back to Jerusalem and tarry there until they be filled with the Holy Ghost amen so when they got it right 120 people that tarried for the promise of the Spirit that hung with it until the day of Pentecost came were filled with the Holy Ghost and it was signified by the fire. All right, back to the lamps to cause the lamp to burn always. I don't have time to go into the typology of the tabernacle. When you study the tabernacle, the, the, there's a lot of symbolism there. Everything about the tabernacle re resembles something about Jesus Christ. Even the way the tabernacle was laid out, you might have seen it before, but uh, it literally, everything was arranged in the shape of a cross. And it began at the, with the burnt offering of the brass, uh, the brass altar at the entrance. And then from there to a labor of water where they washed. We have repentance. We have water baptism. They entered into the holy place. Amen. And that is where the lamp was burning. And there was other things that took place there. That's where they ate from the showbread off the table of showbread. But uh, that's also where the priests offered up incense unto God on a little golden incense off a altar. And there was a veil there. And the other side of that represents, I guess many believe that represented heaven. Amen. But we come into the holy place and then beyond that is the holiest of holies. And it's just one big room, but it's separated with this heavy, thick veil. And so it was there that you serve God, but you need the fire burning so that you can uh, have illumination. Amen. As you eat the bread, which represents the word of God, Jesus said, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. Amen. And, and so forth. As you eat that, unless you have the illumination of the Spirit of God, and, and unless the lamps are filled with oil and trimmed and burning, there's no illumination. There's no growth. There's no progress. Amen. And so all of these things are necessary. And not only that, but when they offered up incense. Now, I want you to get something straight. I want you to get something straight. Let's get, let's get this, let's figure this out. Let's make sure we got a clear understanding on this. They did not offer praise and incense unto God before they entered the tabernacle. What did they do? They offered up a sacrifice. That was a place of repentance. That was a place of being right with God. I'm gonna tell you, God will not accept your offering of praise if there's unrepentant sin in your life. You can't shout over sin. I don't care how fast you run. I don't care how high you jump, how much you buck, snort, and holler. You can't overcome sin in your life by worship. You overcome sin by repentance. This is important. You don't come to church with conviction and condemnation over things you've done that you know is not right. And when the music starts, you get up and start kicking and shouting and you think you're going to shout your way through the victory. You may get a little excited and you may feel some emotion. But if you're not careful, you are going to deceive yourself and think you're all right when you're not. You're going to get to where you can't tell the real from the false. You can't discern between human emotion and excitement and a real touch of God. We're not after a lot of noise and a lot of motion and a lot of commotion. 
We're after acceptance from God. We want the praise of our lips and, and the fruit of our lips to be acceptable unto him. We want to offer him something that meets a need that he has. Well, while I'm on it, praise and worship is not for the purpose of making you feel good, although it does. But the purpose of praise and worship is to exalt Jesus and to make him feel good and to let him know how much we love him and appreciate him and thank him for his goodness and for bringing salvation to us. I don't think everybody's understanding what I'm saying, but I'm telling you it does matter what your reason for worship is. You be seated. I went to a camp meeting many, many years ago, and I won't even give you a hint where it was at. It was somewhere between the North Pole and the South Pole and the East Coast and the West Coast. That narrows it down as far as I'm going to narrow it down. But I went, and and uh, uh, it was a camp meeting. It was in a it was in a tabernacle. It had a roof and floor, but no sides. And and they started service. There wasn't there wasn't prayer time before service. You just uh, everybody standing around talking, what have you? And then somebody stepped up there, and they got on the piano, and they got on the drums, and they got on the instruments, and buddy, they cranked it up. And a man stepped up there to MC and lead the service. He said, I don't know what you came to do tonight. But he said, I came to dance. What would you come to do? And the crowd responded, we came to dance. He said, let's dance then. And they cranked up the music. And away they went. And after about 30 or 45 minutes, they noticed that I wasn't dancing. And, uh, and uh, I'm just standing there in amazement. And, uh, and so they, they, they stopped uh, shouting for a little bit and they did a little preaching and exhorting. And uh, yeah, there's some of you that won't get in and worship. You're just standing here looking on. Amen, and they, they worked me over pretty good, and I had a couple of men with me from my church and worked us all over, and then they cranked her up again. Well, anyway, it kept, they went again, and then uh, finally, brother, they, they got so bold as they come and invited us up front with them, and they're praying for me, laying hands on me, because I'm bound. <laughs> and the longer they prayed, the more bound I felt. <laughs> So at a certain point in time when they weren't looking, they slacked up. I said, let's get out of here, guys. <laughs> you know, do you go to church just because you like to sing? Do you go to church just because you like the music cranked up? Do you get up front to dance and move around and sway with the music because you like the way it feels? Are you from your heart offering unto God real sincere praise? We talk about the old days, and I'll be 70 years old in October this year, and I was born and raised in a Pentecostal home. That's all I know. And I was in a time period that a lot of people like to refer back to. The church I grew up in was a very spiritual church, very special move of God in that church. And I think I probably have seen real moves of God probably as much as anybody here today and maybe more. And, of course, that puts a greater responsibility upon me. To whom much is given, what? Much is required. But I saw people back in the day, we didn't have any songs 
that we sung that made you want to get up and turn flips? We didn't, we, we didn't, we didn't have drums. We did have an upright bass and somebody thumped a little bit, had an organ and piano, played some horns, other things. But there was no driving beats in any of the songs that were sung. Oh, doesn't that sound boring? How many of you? And uh, we, all of us knew all the words to the songs. We understood those words. We knew what they meant. And when we'd start singing about the old rugged cross, tears would run down people's cheeks and drip off on their clothes. And when we sung songs such as when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that would be. You could see the true joy on people's faces as hands lifted up. Oh, I can't wait. I can't wait until I get to go to heaven. Amen. And, and, but I'm not trying to say we have to sing those songs. I'm telling you, somewhere along the road, we have veered a little bit too far in that direction. And in so many places, it's more of a fleshly demonstration. It's the same feeling that is at a concert. Rock music being played. It's the same feeling when they got the mosh pit. I've been places, not here, but I have been places. It's called a youth conference where it's nothing but a mosh pit. It gets louder and louder and louder. And the thing that seems that people are most proud of is how loud it got and how wild it got. Oh, it's getting quiet. But do we want to get back to the old paths or not? We want to see signs and wonders and miracles. You can't beat the drums loud enough and hard enough to conjure up signs, wonders, and miracles. It's not going to come by fleshly carnal demonstration. It's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. God is bringing us back to that place. There is a restoration of true apostolic power that is coming into the church right now. Things are happening like I haven't seen since I was a child. Praise God. Run up here, Brother Chad Short, quick as you can. He got bit by, get on up here. He got bit by a tick that was a carrier of Lyme's disease. This young man works hard with his hands. He's a horse farrier. He he shoes horses. And it takes a lot of strength to do that all day long, day after day after day. And he got bit by this tick and got the Lyme's disease. And every morning he hurt so bad he could hardly get out of bed. He couldn't hardly move his joints because of the arthritis that was caused by Lyme's disease. And when that happens and it gets that far, there ain't a whole lot they can do for you. But I was teaching on divine healing in the adult Bible class. And the spirit of God moved through that auditorium. And God touched him. God touched him and healed him right there of Lyme's disease. He came to the front and told me what had happened. He's on one of our young preachers. And I, I, I gave him special, special permission. I handed him a bottle of oil. And there's a man from Africa sitting all the way back on the back row that has the worst crippling arthritis I've ever seen in my life. And I said, take this bottle of oil and go pray for that man. Amen. He went back there and prayed for him. And the man's arms were like this. And he couldn't even raise them more than that. God touched him and healed his arms. And he stretched them up in the air. 
Praise God. Another young man standing close by said, would you pray for me? He had a torn rotor cuff and it had been, uh, what, three or four years, and he, five years. He hadn't had anything done about it. And, and he anointed him and prayed for him and God healed that torn rotor cuff. That was about all the anointing that took place that day. Amen. But the power of God swept through that church and there have been Many, many, many documented miracles that happened in that one. It wasn't even a service. It was a Sunday school class. Amen. But it just began to happen and spread across. A man was healed of cancer, a very visible cancer on his face. We got the before and after x-rays documented from the doctors. He was going to have to have a dreadful surgery and remove part of his face and, and part of this bone structure around his eye and his jaw, his jaw bone, and hoping then they could get enough of it that it wouldn't go on into his brain and kill him. Amen. But God healed him that Sunday of that cancer. We got the before and after pictures from the doctors. Another young preacher of my church was healed of acute diabetes, sugar diabetes that day, the kind that's hard to control. He'd almost died several times from problems with that diabetes, and God healed him there that Sunday. I could go on and on and on. We weren't beating drums. We weren't seeing how loud we could be. We were just listening to the word of God, and somebody got a hold of it, and the Holy Ghost began to work and move. And I'm telling you, the same power of God is in this place today. Amen. You don't have to wait for some special event to take place. You can get the Holy Ghost. Amen. While the word is being preached, you can have your healing right here in the presence of God. Jesus Christ is not shame, changed. Amen. If we will go back to the old past, amen, and ask for the old past, for that is the good way, amen. God is going to answer that sincere prayer. The more we get back to consecration, the more we get back to walking with God, the more we get back to true holiness where we're doing what we're doing because we want to please God, the more favor you're going to have with God, the more he's going to manifest his glory and power. Amen. We're going to see the things that we prayed about, preached about, and talked about for so many years. God wants to do it. He's waiting on us. The prophets of old said that God was going to send the former rain and the latter rain. And most Bible scholars agree that God has promised in both the Old and the New Testament that when he wraps up the church age and takes the church out of here, he is going to visit this world with the greatest, somebody's not going to like what I'm saying, but it's going to be the greatest revival that we have ever experienced. When is it going to happen? When we get where God wants us to be. When we get everything in order. When we finally figure out how it's supposed to be done. When we quit getting all of our songs from the charismatic movement. When we quit trying to mimic and mock the ways, the things they do to get people out to church. And we go back, amen, to an old fashioned prayer meeting until we pray the power down, until the Holy Ghost begins to move. They cannot compete with that. I believe the only church in the city I pastor are the true apostolic churches. That's it. Some that claim to be apostolic are not true apostolic. But that's all I'm going to say about that. That's between them and God. 
Amen. I don't consider the charismatics to be a church. I don't consider the Baptist to be a legitimate New Testament church because they don't have the New Testament doctrine of salvation right and a number of other things. Amen. The Catholic movement is not the church. He only has one church, and that's the church. Amen. That he gave his blood for. That's the church he's coming back after. And I apologize if I'm offensive to anybody, but I plead with you, get to reading the book of Acts and see if your salvation experience matches what they, what's written in the book of Acts. Me, many are being lied to and told that this is true Bible salvation when they don't go far enough. But preacher, I'm sincere. I believe you are. Let's come on and get everything God has for you. Don't stop short. I'm preaching longer than I thought I would. Forgive me. Supernatural fire is what it took to light the candlesticks the first time. They took fire off the altar, supernatural fire, and they brought it and they lit the candlesticks. But it was a responsibility of the priest to keep it burning. Every day the wicks had to be trimmed and the reservoir filled with fresh oil. Now, it was not an optional thing. It was a daily task that must be performed 24-7 perpetually from now on. Again, not just any fire would do, but it had to be that fire that was ignited by God when his glory filled the tabernacle. You know, they had to, you know, move from one location to another. What did they do during that time? They made sure they had some of that fire still burning. Could not go out. It had to be perpetual. As soon as they got the tabernacle set back up, everything in place, they took that same fire and kept that fire burning. Kept that fire burning. Amen. But you know, at the t- dedication of the tabernacle, all times and all places, Eli, he's the high priest. Uh, not Eli, Aaron is a high priest. And he's got four sons that are priests. And Nadab and Abihu took their censers and put incense in it. And instead of going to the altar and getting some of that fire from God, they started their own fire. And they set that incense on fire. And as they walked through the congregation, it smelled just like incense smells when it's burning. You or I could not have told the difference. Amen. But the one that really mattered knew the difference. He said, that's a stench. Something's not right here. They're acting just like priests are supposed to act, doing what priests are supposed to be doing, and burning the same incense. The incense was men offered was made according to the pattern that was given to Moses in the mountain. But they lit their incense offering with strange fire. You know, they were young. They were dumb. They wanted the result, the effect. But they didn't want to go to the trouble, just a little more trouble. And so they cut some corners. Amen. And no doubt they were thinking, fire is fire. What's the difference? So what difference does it make? And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them as censure, put fire therein, put incense thereon, offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Others may not can tell the difference in your shout even when you have been living in fornication. They may not can tell the difference in your shout. Amen. Even though you've been telling lies. 
even though you've been dabbling with drugs, even though your dabbling has already been mentioned with pornography and some other things, going places you shouldn't go, doing things you shouldn't do. But when you come to church, you get your censor out and you put some incense on it. What kind of fire are you using to light your incense? Is this holy fire from God that you prayed down before church or early that morning? Where's your fire coming from? There's only one fire God's going to take, and that's the fire that he started in your soul initially. And it's up to you to keep it burning perpetually, 24-7. Now listen to me. I'm wrapping it up. But it's God's desire for every church represented here, every youth group here at this conference. It's God's desire for you to take this revival spirit home with you when you return. I know, Sunday, we're going to have a one wild service because I got about 60 young people from my church plus the adults that accompanied them that's going to be chomping at the bits. Amen. And uh, youth leaders, you don't dilly-dally around all day and get them in at 2 in the morning. I want them home before midnight. Okay? I don't want them worn out because I want them to be able to come to church. Amen. And let's have church. Okay. I just had to do a little pastoring. I'm sorry. It'll be fine. Amen. And we want to stop here. We want to stop there. Well, you better get them on the road and get them home. I'm not going to blame the kids or your wives because they want to spend more time at the outlet mall. We're going to see who's men. <laughs> who's in charge? See if you really deserve to be a preacher or not. No pressure. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. But I want to put this in real practical terms. You're not going to be screaming and shouting and hollering about what I'm fixing to talk about. In fact, I'm going to sit down. That way I'm relaxed and you're relaxed. I want you to hear what I'm going to say. If you want to keep what you've gotten here at this conference, it's really simple. You're going to have to have your own personal walk with God. You're going to have to have a consistent prayer life. You're going to need to get into the word. Amen. Are you listening to me? And every young man that claims he has a call to preach on his life ought to read the Bible through at least once every year. If, 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 if you have a call to preach, what are you going to preach from? Louis L'Amour? I went to a youth service back a long time ago when we used to do stuff like that. And, uh, and I had a first cousin, and he said he had a call to preach. And lo and behold, they let him, they let him preach this, this youth service. And uh, he got up there, and boy, it was interesting. I, I, I recognized several things from the book of Louis L'Amour. He, he never he never even used anything out of the Bible, but boy, he's a good storyteller and on and on, you know. So when he got through and, and when church was over, you know, I'm several years older than him and he wanted to impress me. I guess he said, hey, what would you think about my preaching tonight? I said, well, I feel if you ever learn the word of God as much as you have Louis L'Amour, you might make a preacher. So if you were going to be a soldier in old times, every soldier must learn how to use a spear and a sword and a shield and a few other things.
Now, what kind of warrior are you going to make if you never spend any time practicing your swordsmanship? If you can't even find Acts 2.38 in your Bible, uh, was that in the Old Testament or the New Testament? It was between. Sort of, kind of. So, now, that's just for you wannabe preachers, and I hope every one of them that wants to be becomes a tremendous preacher. But God and your pastor will help you figure all that out. But listen to me. Young person, how are you going to be a soul winner? How are you going to be effective for God? How are you going to be able to offer to God an acceptable sacrifice of yourself, your life, if you don't spend some time in the Word, if you don't spend some time communicating with Him? If the only time you pray is over your food, I commend you for doing that, but let's take it to the next level. You've got that down. I think you can master. Let's let's move up a step. Are you listening to me? How are we going to keep that fire burning? What do we have to do to get it started? We keep our heart cleaned out? Come on. Don't be too proud to admit you've done wrong and make it right. Right with whoever you wrong. Right with God. Amen. And move on and learn from that experience. But I'm pleading with you young people. I looked across from where I was sitting over here and I saw this group here of all these young men. And I told my wife, I said, look at that fine group of young men across there. And I said, oh, that, that, it brought tears to my eyes because I could see the earnestness on your face while Elder Garrett was preaching. And I covet every one of you for God. If God would allow me to call people to preach, I'd call every one of you. But I know what God has already called each one of you to be, and that's to be a saint, to have a walk with God, to live a Christian life, to have a burden for the lost. Praise God. Hey, do you want to be a part of what God is going to do in the near future in this apostolic movement? I conclude with this. Repent you therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. There are times of refreshing that come from God's presence. Amen. But in that verse of scripture, if you want to go look a little bit closer uh, at that verse of scripture, maybe do a little word study or something, you will find that in that passage of scripture, it's literally saying, repent you therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. And the times of refreshing can come. Which means, to a certain extent, we control when the times of refreshing come into our life, into our church. When we repent and change, convert it, our sins are blotted out and the times of refreshing come from the presence of the Lord. Elder Garrett made reference to the visitation. These preachers had gathered together and sought God for five days with fasting and prayer and what God said. And God said the ones that he was going to visit are those that still, how was the wording? Bear his image to be like Jesus. We used to sing this song with tears running down our eyes face, eyes closed and hands uplifted to be like Jesus, to be like Jesus. On earth, I long to be like him. All through life's journey from earth to glory, I only ask to be like him. Does anybody want to be like Jesus? Does anybody want to present their bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is our Reasonable. 
service. Are there any young people today that wants to be true worshipers? Jesus said the woman at the well, the hour cometh and now is when true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Thank God for spirit, energy, effort. Whatsoever you do, whatever your hands find to do, do it with all your might. I don't have a problem with that, but let's also be in the spirit. Let's don't forget truth and righteousness. Come on, let's take it to a new level. I charge every young person here today, I charge you before the Lord Jesus Christ to return home and accept your personal responsibility of keeping the fire burning in your soul. When I, was a, when I was a child, a young person had a horrible, horrible uh, uh, temper. It didn't take much to set me off. And uh, it's something I struggled with even when I was feeling called to preach. And I learned how to overcome something like that. First, I recognized that this is a sin. Okay? And, uh, and anyway, there was a little pride involved too. And when I recognized that and I repented of the sin of pride, which fueled a lot of my violent tendencies, that was a good starting place. And when I got really convicted of all of that, I still had to deal with something that had been a part of my personality, probably in my, in my DNA from the time I was born, and I had uh, really worked at perfecting it and and it was pretty ingrained. And you know what I learned? I had, I, I, I come up on my own, God helped me, because I really wanted to overcome, and he knew I wanted to. Every time things that people said or did, I started feeling that anger rise up. I knew my flesh wasn't dead enough. So I go do some praying and some fasting. I stayed after it until... Uh, I conquered that. I still have, you know, I still have a personality of passion, but I'm not angry, want to fight people, hurt people. Huh? I can't change my personality, but I have control. There's a difference. I have control. And if you have a personality or you have a tendency or you have a habit of getting all excited about something for a few days and then you get bored and you move on to something else, this is your responsibility to overcome that. This is your assignment. You need to quit being a quitter and learn how to finish things that you start. And one of the things you want to finish is this race. Amen. Take on the responsibility of going home and building a consistent walk with God. I've lied to you two times. I, I'm going to make it number three and then I hope I can get out of here. I've told you two times. I was just one more thing and I was going to quit. But this impressed to me so strongly. One of the, one of the greatest things that ever happened in the Bible to an individual was when God translated Enoch. Enoch never died. And I got to looking at that a while back and I was amazed. You know, uh, there's people did all kinds of great exploits for God. Really big, great, wonderful things. And they didn't get translated. There's people suffered all kinds of things. And they didn't get translated. What's the key here? And I got to looking at it. It's real simple. What did he do? He did what? Well, I think anybody could do that, couldn't they? That's the only thing that it tells. He walked with God. 
and he had this testimony that he pleased the Lord. And God took him. He was not, or he was gone, for God took him. Now, all it takes to be saved is just to walk with God, just to please the Lord, just to do what's pleasing in his sight, the consistency of living for God. Just to walk, just to stroll. Another old song comes back to mind. Just let me walk with you, Jesus. Don't ever leave me alone, for without you, I could never make heaven my home. Hallelujah. Does anybody have a desire to please the Lord today? Does anybody have a desire to bring real revival to the church that you're a member of? Is there anybody here that truly wants to be used of God? Wants to be a soul winner? Wants to be an encourager. Wants to be a friend to those that need a friend. Come on, let's talk to God together right now. God, I give myself to you. I offer you my everything. Praise God. Hallelujah. I wish I'd have thought of it. I would, have, I would have gone to a restaurant. I would have begged from them. I would have bought it or talked them out of it or something. I would have got me a big stack of these styrofoam takeout boxes. Amen. And say, is there anybody here that wants to fill one of these up and take it home with you? Are you going to leave everything here or are you going to take it home with you? And when you get home with it, what are you going to do with it? You're going to share it with somebody else? Amen. Are you going to continue to go back to that source of living water that's been preached about here? Amen. And get that refreshing, that renewing every day that the elder talked about just a little bit ago. Praying through on a regular basis. Touching God. God touching you. Amen. Overcoming. Praise God. I said overcoming the things in your life that the devil uses to trip you up. Laying aside the sin and every weight that does so easily beset us that we may run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author, the one that started all this, and the finisher of our faith, the one that's going to help us finish this race. Let's give thanks and praise to God together right now. Oh, come on, make a commitment to God. Yes, Lord. Amen. I think it only be appropriate if we spend some time in prayer. We don't want this to get away. Amen. Young men, help us very quickly.